All right, um, let's pray and then we'll begin. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for enabling us to be able to gather on Zoom and have this Bible study online. Father God, we thank you for all of our Evergreen Church members, how they have faithfully continued to stay with the word and to just worship you at every available opportunity. Father, help us to just continue with this, to be faithful in our worshiping and in our Bible studies so that our faith may always be going up and that you may gift us with the wings of eagles so that we could soar on high even though the world may be getting darker. Father, we pray that um, you will truly just have mercy upon this world and let this coronavirus die out so that we could return back to our normal lives and that we may be able to gather together at church once again. Father, we pray for all of our Evergreen Church members and their families. May you protect them like the apple of your eye and just watch over every single one of them and surround them with the fiery walls of the Holy Spirit so that no darkness may come into their lives. Please be with us throughout this Bible study, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will touch our hearts and open our hearts, help us to focus on your word, and may you seal all of our foreheads with the word of God so that we may be protected in these end times. Thank you so much for everything and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so good to have everybody here with us. Um, I think this is our third Bible study, right? So just want to let you guys know that uh, I've never done a Bible study like this, this entire series um that we've been having um so and i've heard from a couple of people that it's kind of hard and uh, i'm sure if this is the first time that you guys are listening to this it may be a little bit difficult so today i want to spend a lot of time just reviewing a little bit just going over everything that we've learned so far just so that we're on the same page here so at first um we learned about the parable of the fig tree right um, that was in Matthew chapter 24, verses 32 through 33. In the parable, uh, Jesus talks about the fig tree, right? The fig tree symbolizes Israel, the nation of Israel. So the parable of the fig tree basically talks about how the nation of Israel will just die. It will disappear and then it will come back to life. And when you see it coming back to life, then you know summer is near. And in Israel, summertime is the time of harvest, not autumn, right? So when it says that summer, you will see that summer is near, it means judgment is near. Because harvest in the Bible symbolizes judgment. So when you see Israel come back to life, then you will know that judgment is near and the return of Christ is near. So in AD 70, as Jesus predicted, the Romans completely decimated Israel, destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, um, burned everything down. And not only that, they kicked out all of the Jewish people from their own land. So the Jewish people from AD 70 were basically homeless. They didn't have a country. They were scattered throughout the world. And then almost 2,000 years later, in 1917, um, towards the end of the First World War, uh, the British Prime Minister named Balfour made a declaration. It's called the Balfour Declaration. He said that all Jews could return back to Israel, to their land. And then in 1948, Israel gained independence. Okay. Independence. And then in 1967, they, by this time, they still had not regained Jerusalem. In 1967, they regained Jerusalem but they still have not regained uh, the Temple Mount. So you, you look at these years, they're all related with world wars. This, the first thing is related with World War I. World War I enabled Israel to regain their land. World War II enabled Israel to gain independence. This is a six days war. And then basically, world war, there will be a third world war. That's what the Bible is pr prophesying. The third world war 
may have something to do with the restoration or regaining or recovering of the Temple Mount. So that's the parable of the fig tree. So as you can see, this all happened in the 20th century. That means when you see these things happening, Jesus said, then you know that it is near, right? So we're getting close. That's the point of all this Bible study is to teach us that we're getting close to the end time. So we need to be prepared, right? And then secondly, we learned about the seven seals. And this is in Revelation chapter 6. Okay. Among the seven seals, the first through the fourth seals are the four horsemen, right? Sometimes you may have heard about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. It's talking about this right here. The first horse was the white horse, and it went out to conquer. Okay. The second horse was the red horse. Oh, the white horse conquering. This is not a, a actual physical battles, but this is a spiritual conquering, right? The second horse is the red horse that symbolizes war. The third horse was the black horse that symbolizes famine. The fourth horse was ashen, or it, sometimes it's translated as pale. And that symbolizes pestilence or plagues, right? So uh, uh, amongst these four, we need to really understand this first one. Because in Revelation 6, 8, it described the first one as wild beasts. How does the white horse conquering have anything to do with wild beasts? Well, uh, we learned that it's talking about the beastly worldview okay and it conquered and the rain it started to uh, reign over the world since the 18th century during the enlightenment remember that's when they said we don't need god there is no god the only thing we need is human reason in or, and we could achieve utopia. Basically, that's what they're saying. We don't need God if, because human beings are smart enough that we, we just use our intellect and reason. We will be able to gain infinite progress and, have, and make utopia. Like basically, we could make heaven here on earth with our own strength. Okay? And that's what we call the beastly worldview. Why do I call it that? Okay. Uh, in order to understand that, we need to know the difference between human beings and beasts. What's the difference? Human beings are comprised of spirit, soul, and body, right? Human beings have three parts. But beasts don't have spirits. They only have soul and body. Okay? That's what Psalm 49 verse 20 is basically saying. So let's look at that. Uh, Psalm chapter 49, verse 20. It says, Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. So basically what this is teaching us is that if we don't receive the word of God, our spirit dies. And if our spirit dies, basically we look like human beings, we talk and act like human beings, but from a biblical standpoint, from a biblical definition, if our spirit is dead, we're basically the same as beasts, right? If our spirit dies, okay? Another thing that, oops, that we could compare is if we go to Genesis chapter 2, 7, when God created Adam, how did he create him? He, Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, right? Many people interpret this as being actual physical breathing, right? But it's not that. The breath of life symbolizes the spirit of God. How do I know this? If you go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 19, this is how God created animals. Out of the ground, the Lord God, God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. You see? It says out of the ground. Out of The word here is out of the dirt of the ground. The dust of the ground, Lord formed the beast. But God never breathed into them the breath of life, right? But they were alive already. So God brought them to Adam and Adam named them, right? So the difference here in the forming, in the creation of man and beast, the difference 
is the breath of life. God gave man the breath of life, but in Genesis 2.19, God never gave beasts the breath of life. So the breath of life does not sim- is not talking about physical breath, but it's talking about the spirit of God. So what is the human essence? What makes human beings unique from all animals? It is the spirit of God. It's our spirit. The fact that we could, the fact that we have received the spirit of God, the fact that we could recognize that there is a God, the fact that we could worship and praise God, the fact that we could receive his word, that is the only unique trait that a human being has over animals. Everything else is the same. So if we lose that, we lose the human essence. And basically, we're just like beasts. So that's why in the 18th century, during the Enlightenment, when these philosophers started to say, we don't need God, we just need human reason, this is the beastly worldview. Because during that time, science... science was um and science and technology was developing right so they basically said there is no spiritual world that's all superstition there's only matter there's only things you could see and feel and touch right so if they deny the spiritual world that's basically saying there is no spirit right that's why it's called a beastly worldview because a beast is a being that has no spirit Okay. And this beastly worldview has been reigning over this world since the 18th century until today. Okay. That's what the white horse is talking about. That's the conquering. That beastly worldview has conquered the world from that point on. Okay. And then in the 19th century, we had the Industrial Revolution. So technology really advanced and the standard of living actually got a lot better, right? So they thought, wow, that what they were saying in the 18th century is real. It's going to happen. It seemed like human beings, if they come together, that they could create heaven on earth. Okay. So I want to kind of remind you just a side note here. Think about what they were doing here in the 18th and 19th century. They wanted to make heaven on earth Okay, called utopia using human strength, right? And human reason. What does this remind you of? This should remind you of Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. What is that? That's the Tower of Babel. What did they do in the Tower of Babel? Remember, they were building this huge high tower. And what was their goal? Their goal was to reach heaven, it says. Okay, let's go there. Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. says, the whole world, the whole earth used the same language and the same words. And then verse 3, it says, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone. So this is important. They used brick for stone. Stone is natural, right? Stone is God-given. Brick is human-made. So they use something man-made to replace something that God gave them, right? And what was their, what were they trying to do with that? In verse 4, it says, they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Their point was to reach heaven on their own, without God. They're saying, we could do this. We don't need God. So what did God do? God came down and confused their language, right? He says, come, let us go down and there, confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So if there's confusion of language, what's going to happen? They can't work together. And then eventually there's going to be strife and conflict, right? So basically, in the 18th and 19th century, they were attempting the same thing. They were trying to, uh, attempting to build a spiritual tower of Babel. They were trying to build utopia, heaven on earth. They were trying to reach heaven without God's help. That's how high up their human pride had gone up at that point. So what did God do? God confused their languages, right? What, what's the result of being confusion of language? If, there, if you can't communicate, what happens? You fight, right? So in the 20th century, it, the century of wars happened, right? In 1914, World War I. 
1939, World War II. And then so many other wars, Korean War, Vietnam War, on and on and on, etc. You, you guys know about all that, right? So you see what happened when God confused their language? What was all the result of this technology that they built up? It was used to kill each other. And it was the most brutal war ever in the history of mankind, right? Some 50 to 100 million people died, they said. You know, so many people died, right? And then during this time, they had the Spanish flu pandemic, which is the, the ashen horse, the pale horse, right? Pestilence. And then in 1929, there was the Great Depression. That's basically a famine. When the economy goes into a recession or depression, that's like a famine, right? So all those things, the first through the fourth seal all happen, okay? And they are continuing to happen, right? And then the fifth seal was about martyrs, right? The martyrs received white robes. They were justified. They were vindicated. And then they, God said, just wait a little more until uh, the, the fullness of the number of martyrs comes into, it, it's filled, right? So basically what this seal is teaching us is that there will continue to be persecution for, th for those people who want to live godly lives, okay? And then the sixth seal brought about earthquakes, the sun was darkened, and stars fell from the sky. Okay, so what do, what do all these things mean? Earthquake, we said, is the process of truth being shaken. Truth was shaken. But the earth is what we step on, what we're living on, right? It's something that we trust in. It's stable. We think that it won't move, right? But when that moves, everything crumbles, right? So truth is the foundation that we've built our lives upon. But those truths were started to get shaken, especially for the unbelieving world. And how does this show about? We're living in it right now. We're living in post, the postmodern era, right? What is the main characteristic of the postmodern era is relativism. Relativism basically means there is no absolute truth. There is no truth with a capital T. Whatever you believe in is the truth. So, hey, if you believe that, that's your truth. If I believe this, that's my truth. Okay, that's called relativism. That's postmodernism. So when that came into that kind of started in the late. 20th century, like mid to late 20th century. That's when this, you know, spiritual earthquake happened. And then the sun gets darkened, right? How does that happen? Through human pride. When human beings get proud, their pride blocks off the sun. Okay, their pride prevents human beings from receiving the word of God. Because they're too proud, they don't need it. Right? They don't need God. And in, let's go to Revelation chapter 9. Verses 1 through 4. So when the fifth angel sounded the trumpet, a star fell from heaven. He opened up the bottomless pit. And what happened? In verse 2, it says, He opened the bottomless pit and smoke went up. Smoke went up out of the pit like a smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit, right? The sun and the air were darkened. Sun and air. So smoke, you know, it goes up, right? So that symbolizes human pride, okay? The star that fell from heaven, okay? Satan, senior pastor said, uses lies and flattery okay it, the satan uses lies and flattery to trick humankind what kind of flattery for example the word the, the word in hebrew the word flattery in hebrew means to give special honor to someone but actually when it's used negatively it means to give false honor to someone it's like saying you know let's say like 
I play a little bit guitar and they say, wow, you're better than Jimi Hendrix or something. That's like false honor, right? And normal people will be like, oh, why are you saying that? That's not true. But if you're proud, what do you do? You say, oh yeah, maybe I am better than him, Jimi Hendrix. Right? You start to believe in those lies, right? So when did Satan do this? He did this to Adam. When Satan said to Adam, when the serpent said to Adam, look, look at that tree. You know why God doesn't want you to eat from that tree? Because he knows that if you eat from it, you'll be just like God. That's why he's afraid. And so he's not letting you eat it. So he's using these lies and this flattery. Basically what he is implying is, Adam, you're as good as God. You could be as high up as God. But he's holding you down, man. He's like pushing you down. He won't let you rise up. So you should do it. And that's what Satan did to humankind in the 18th century as well, during the Enlightenment. Look, human beings are so smart. You don't need God. You're as smart as God. You could make heaven without God. That's the flattery. It's the false like honor they give, that he's giving to you, false glory. And if, you're, if you have pride in you, you're going to tend to believe in those things. So you got to be careful about that. That's why in Proverbs chapter 16, it says, you know, pride goes before destruction. Human pride is very dangerous. We have to be very aware of this. Okay? Pride goes before destruction. So that's why the sun and the, that smoke, that smoke is human pride. And who opened it? Who let it out? That fallen star, right? The devil. Okay? Satan did. How did he let it out? Using lies and flattery. Okay? So this is what Senior Pastor said. He said, Satan uses lies and flattery to stoke the embers of pride that are like dormant in human beings okay satan uses lies and flatteries to stoke the embers of pride that are dormant in human beings and once that happens what happens you know like when you go camping after like you go to sleep at night you don't turn the campfire off or you don't like put it out and then in the morning there's like little embers still kind of red and you blow on it a little bit and what happens smoke comes out of it right that's what Satan's doing because everybody has that pride in you and Satan knows it and he's using it. And when he slowly blows hot air into you, what happens? That smoke rises up and that's going to block off the sun and the air. It's going to darken the sun and the air, right? The sun and the air, air is about breathing, right? And what is our spiritual breathing? Spiritual breathing is prayer. Sun is the word of God. And word and prayer are basically what we need to become holy, right? 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5 says, we are sanctified by word and prayer. If Satan darkens word and prayer, that's it. Then, you know, what are we going to, how are we going to sanctify ourselves? We can't. So that's the result of this pride that Satan stoked within us, right? And then from the smoke, out of the smoke comes what? Comes locusts. And these are spiritual locusts, right? Because it says in Revelation chapter 9, verse 4, it says it's not supposed to eat any of the green things, any trees. It only hurts human beings who don't have the seal of God, right? Locusts only eat green things and trees and plants. But... It says it's not supposed to eat that. So it says a spiritual locust. So what does a spiritual locust do? Spiritual locust eats away at the green things within us. Those are, the green things are the things of life, right? Things that have life. Those are our you know, spiritual gifts, our fruits, our faith, the word that's in us. So the locust, spiritual locust eats away at our spiritual fruits. Okay. So when pride comes up, out of that comes locusts. The smoke comes up, right? Smoke is pride. When pride comes up, locusts come in and eats away all of our spiritual fruits. So we lose all of that that we have built up in our life of faith just like that. That's why it's so dangerous. And then these locusts have tails that could sting. And it torments for five months. 
but it doesn't kill you. And these sting tails are like scorpions. They could, you know, they could sting you like scorpions. Okay, but it can't kill you. So this is sort of like the test that Job went through in Job chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, right? God let Satan touch Job. God let Satan test Job by hurting him, health, his health, taking away his wealth, even his children. But God said, don't kill him, right? So this, the, the tormenting sting of the tail of the locust is sort of like that. And when that happens, when the trials and tribulations come into our lives, that may happen. Those kinds of torments may come. And those torments are there to have, they have two purposes. Either they will strengthen your faith or they will make you fall away from the faith, right? And we can see that in Job, Job and his wife. When you compare Job and his wife, what did his wife say? His wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? That's, that would be better than to go through the suffering. But Job did not sin, right? Let's look at that. Uh, Job chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. So Job, uh, this is what his wife said. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. See that? The, the, Job and his wife show us the two ways that you could go from this test. You could be like the wife, curse God and die. Or you could be like Job. You know, God gave us all the good things, so he could give us the adversity too, right? But we still will give praise to God. That's what Job did. He kept his faith. That's why he was acknowledged in the end, and he received double blessing for everything he had. Okay? So we must have that kind of faith, like Job. When the trials come, we must be able to have the faith to endure until the end. Um, and remember when this happens, it says in Revelation chapter six, that some stars will fall right here. Okay. That's what is scary here, right here. Some stars will fall. Stars symbolize saints, believers. When these trials come, some of the stars will fall away. That's why this is so scary. Let's look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 10. Look, it says, At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Right? Many will fall away. That's what Jesus is saying about the end times. So we have to be really prepared. Okay? And... Also, it says that the power of the locusts was where? Was in their tails, right? In their tail. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9, 15. The head is the elder and the honorable man, and the prophet who teaches falsehood is the tail, right? So what does the tail symbolize in the Bible? Tail symbolizes false prophet. And many false prophets have come and gone. Many more will come in the future. That's why we have to be careful. And last time, I talked about three false prophets, right? That we wouldn't expect to be called prophets. They were Karl Marx, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, Nietzsche, and Freud, right? These are the false prophets of the modern era. So today, I'm just going to talk a little bit about these guys, because some of you may not really know what they're about. I'm just going to make it really as simple as possible. Okay. Marx, what did he do? He's the guy who you know, started Marxism, which is basically the basis for communism, which eventually became socialism. Okay. So communism and socialism is basically from Marx. So what's wrong with this guy? 
First of all, his philosophy is based, the foundation of his philosophy is that there is no God and there is no spiritual world. He said that religion is the opium of the masses, right? Another important thing that we need to understand, this is the problem with Marx and his philosophy, which is communism and socialism. And you guys know that socialism is coming back right now, right? Even in America, it's getting very trendy, I guess. Um, I don't want to go into politics, but so we need to be aware of this. So why is socialism bad? Many people don't know that. Well, the basis, the foundation is that it's, it's a materialistic philosophy. It's basically materialism. What does materialism mean? It means that there's, it believes in no spiritual world. It only believes in materials, matter, right? That's why it's dangerous. Secondly, it's dangerous because it denies the fallen nature of man. Basically, we as Christians, we say every human being is fallen, right? We're sinners. We're all born as sinners. So we all have a fallen nature. We admit that from the beginning, right? Everything is based on that. So we don't trust in ourselves. We trust only in God, right? And God says, don't trust in human beings because everybody's fallen. Either they may be lying or they may have good intentions, but they're too weak or too frail to do what they want to do, to do the good that they want to do, right? That's why we don't trust in human beings. But this philosophy says, no, human beings aren't fallen. They're just neutral. Okay, there's nothing bad about them, right? And then thirdly, Marx talked about the essence of human beings. What is the main essence, the main point of human beings? What, what do you think he said? For as Christians, what's the essence of human beings? What's our purpose? What's our final goal? What is the essence of human beings as Christians in the Bible? The Bible says that we were created to glorify God. We were created to praise God. That's the purpose why he made us. That's our essence. Our whole life is supposed to glorify God and praise God. But what did Mark say is the essence of human beings? Is to produce. make stuff basically you know human beings like machines remember he was talking about like labor workers right he was for the workers he was an advocate for the workers right who has control of production so basically what he's saying is the essence of human beings is to produce something to make something even if you're in a service industry, you're making something, you're, you know, producing service, whatever, you know. So basically your job is your essence, is what he's saying. And you can see that this is still influencing our lives today. When you meet somebody for the first time, what do you do? You ask them, hey, what do you do, right? When, when they ask you, what do you do? What are they asking? They're asking what your job is, right? So even now, everybody identifies themselves according to their job. So uh, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, you know, from now on, we as Christians, we should say something different. When people ask you, what do you do? You say, I praise God. Because that's our purpose, right? We live to glorify God. That's what we should be focused on. That's our main job. And then our secondary job is your career, right? Whatever you do, your work. But Things have turned upside down, and that's the influence from Mark, uh, Marx. Yes, but also the another important thing is that because they don't believe in a spiritual world, that means human beings also have no soul, no spirit. Human beings are soulless to them. That's why remember, the first communist country was you know Soviet Union, right, Russia. Stalin killed so many people. They don't even know the actual number of how many people Stalin killed. 50 million, 70 million, uh, who knows? He just killed everybody who was against him. Why do you think they could kill so many people like that? Because human beings don't have a soul. They don't have a spirit. They don't have the image of God like we believe in. So, 
And what's their essence? Is to produce stuff. They're like a machine. Just kill them. It's no, no big deal for them. Right? That's how it could get if you, get, if you take this philosophy to the extreme. Okay? So that's what Marx was all about. And his philosophy still influences us today. And then let's talk about Nietzsche. He's even more difficult to talk about, so I'm just going to just do real quick. What did basically what did Nietzsche say? You know, his thing was called will to power, right? Basically, Nietzsche said we need to reevaluate our morals. You know, in the world, people think this is what's good, this is evil, right? But he says he wants to turn all that upside down. So for Nietzsche, what is evil? What do you think he said was evil? Being weak is evil. That's what he said. Being weak is evil. You got to use your strength, your power to overcome and to just, you know, take and do whatever you want, right? So, for example, like that statement, he didn't say this, but this kind of sums up what he's about. You know, that statement, might is right, that's basically a summary of Nietzsche's statement. If you're strong enough, hey, do it. So, for example, if you watch, you know, Animal Kingdom on TV or whatever, you see a pride of lions, it goes out, hunts down a, a gazelle, and eats it, right? It just ruthlessly just tears it off and eats it. Nobody is going to say, oh, that's an evil lion, right? So basically, Nietzsche is saying the same thing. That's how it's supposed to be, even in the human world. Right? And the thing that he hated the most was Christianity. Oops, sorry. Because Christianity is all about, you know, compassion... If somebody slaps you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. So he said, that's the worst thing ever. He hated Christianity. Those are for losers, he said. Okay. So he changed good and evil just completely upside down. What we would call good, he would call evil. But he would distort it, you know. So... So, but basically, this is like a beastly worldview, isn't it? Might is right. It's like the lions in the animal kingdom. If you're powerful enough, strong enough, you just take whatever you want. That's not evil. That's your natural right. And then Freud, another difficult guy. Basically, what he said is that human beings, humans are driven by what drives us. What do you think? Humans are driven by their basic instincts. Okay. Basically, he said human beings are driven by their basic instincts. That's who we are. Well, in a way, yes, but not all, right? Not always. That's what we're trying to break out of, we as believers, right? As believers, we're trying to break out of that uh, fallen nature and rise above it. To put on the image of God, right? So that we are driven by the Spirit of God, right? Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 13. Uh, 14, sorry. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God, right? This is who we want to become, right? And we're striving uh, to get there. But Freud basically said, no, no, no. All human beings are just basically driven by basic instincts only, especially sex. For him, sex was the main basic instinct. So everything is about sex with this guy, right? And he influenced a lot of things in the 20th century, especially the advertising industry was completely influenced by Freud. So that's why they always use sex to sell, right? That's what we're being bombarded with these days. The Bible talks about what Freud is talking about here. Okay, let's look at two verses. Second Peter, oops, chapter two, verse twelve, and Jude, chapter one, verse ten. 
So Second Peter chapter two, verse 12 says, but these like unreasoning animals born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. So here, Peter likens these people, these fallen people as unreasoning animals, right? unreasoning animals and who are what kind of creatures are they they are born as creatures of instinct so fallen human beings who reject god who, who have not received the word of god are like animals they're like beasts and they are creatures of instinct they're driven by their instinct and that's what freud said basically okay but we as christians we as believers we as people who have received the word we should not live like this right we should not let our instincts drive us okay Jude one ten says basically the same thing. So Jude verse 10 says, But these men revel, revile the things which they do not understand, and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. See? They are destroyed by doing the things that are led by their instincts. And they're like unreasoning animals. Okay? So Freud basically described the very base fallen nature of people who rejected God. And he basically said, all human beings are like this. Well, not all human beings are like that, especially us, those of us who have received God's word. We tried our best to not live like this, right? And through the help of the Holy Spirit, we will rise above these things and we will be changed. That's what the entire Bible is teaching us. Okay. The interesting thing here is when it says unreasoning animals, the Greek word for unreasoning here, and you know what that is? It's written like this. And it's pronounced alogos. That's unreasoning is alogos in Greek. In Greek, like in English, English, when you have A in front, what does that do? It's, it means not, right? So for example, like when you, even if you have the coronavirus, you could be asymptomatic. What does that mean? That means you have no symptoms, right? So when you put the A in front, it means no or not. So unreasoning means a logos. What is logos? Logos is the word, right? So basically it means no word. Human beings that have no word are like animals. They live by their instinct. Okay? That's what unreasoning in Greek means. Okay? But right now, most of the world is going this way. Going the way of our logos. And they're saying, that's how all human beings are. But what we're saying is, well, we may have been born like that, but God's creation, God, the way, reason why God created us is so that we, could, we would transcend out of that, break out of that by receiving God's word and putting on the image of God and to be changed so that we could be conformed to the image of Christ, right? That's why we need to live a life of faith. But when we say that, the people of this world say, ah, oh, that's superstition or whatever, right? So let's look at Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Amen, right? When Christ returns, what is he going to do? He's going to transform even our bodies to conform to the image of the glory of our God. He's going to do that for us. That's our faith. We're awaiting that, right? That's transfiguration, right? And right now through the word, our spirit and soul is being transformed into the image of Christ, right? That's the point of living a, a life of faith, okay? Okay. So, this is how the world is right now. 
then we as Abraham's descendants, how should we be living, right? We are Abraham's descendants, right? How should we live? First, we need to live like Abraham as sojourners or aliens. We need to be aliens in this world. We're not from here. Aliens speak different language. They think differently. They believe differently. They live a different lifestyle. We have to be completely different from this world. We can't be citizens of this world. We have to be aliens. We have to be sojourners. We have to be foreigners. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul, right? As aliens and strangers, abstain from those things that the people of this world are doing, okay? And then, secondly, what else must we be doing? When we see all the things that go around us, we just did this entire Bible study about how this modern world is, right? When we hear this, when we see this, we should be sighing and groaning within ourselves. Okay. We're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4. Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4. The Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city, even through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations which are being committed in its midst. Right? And then look at verse 6. Utterly slay old men, young men, maidens, little children, and women, but do not touch any man on whom is the mark. See? We need to receive that mark on the forehead, right? Who gets that mark? Those people who see all the abominations that are being committed in this world and who sigh and groan about that. People who are repenting about it, who feel bad about it, who are tormented in their hearts about that. Those are the ones that are going to receive the mark on their forehead. That mark in the book of Revelation is called the seal. The seal of God, right? In Revelation chapter 7 verse 3, it says, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. Right? That's the seal that we want to receive. Who gets that? If you sign and groan over all the things, all the abominations that are being committed in this world right now. And in Revelation chapter 9 verse 4, it says, They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Right? In the end times, when the tribulation comes, only those who don't have the seal will get hurt. If you have the seal of God on your foreheads, you will be protected. That's what we need to receive. And we can do that if we sigh and groan over the abominations that are going on around us. But if you look at the things that are going on in the world right now and you think, oh yeah, that's good, that's right. If you agree with those things, then you cannot receive that seal. Because if you agree with those things, then you are like ah logos animals, right? Unreasoning animals, ah logos, without the word. Then you will receive the mark of the beast instead. So in the end times, we need to receive the seal of God on our foreheads in order to make it through the tribulation of the end times and come out of it without receiving the mark of the beast. The only thing that could protect us from getting the mark of the beast is the seal of God on our foreheads. And that's the word of God. Right? Remember, the animals, the beasts, were called a logos, without the word. So in the end times, we need to have the word in us, not just as head knowledge, but really like believing in our hearts and in our lives. We need to live it. That's the only way that we could be protected from the mark of the beast in the end times. So I pray that through these Bible studies, that we will all be sealed with the seal of God on our foreheads so that we could truly be protected from the tribulation that will come in the end times. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your blessings upon our lives. For you have chosen each and every one of us and called us to yourself and have given us this word to open our eyes to the things that are going on around us. God, I pray that at this moment, that the Holy Spirit is here with us and that you yourself are going to each and every person listening to this Bible study and sealing them on their foreheads so that you may protect us 
from all the trials and the tribulations that may come our way in the end times. Father God, help us to truly open our eyes and open our spiritual eyes so that we could see and know how the beast and the devil are working in this world right now. Help us to expose this, to save many more people, and may we be able to live a life that is totally set apart as aliens and sojourners like Abraham did, so that we may be able to walk with you and not receive the mark of the beast. We thank you so much for everything and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's give glory to God with our applause.